started. Uh, again, appreciate having everyone here. This is, uh, this is round six, I think, of our, uh, of our Libby Legacy Project. My name is Gene Reckitt, and I was, I'm kind of on the original committee here. I'm also a science teacher at Libby High School. So uh, before we go, lots of big introductions. Everyone, please raise your hand if I either had you in class, your kids in class, or your grandkids in class. Please raise your hand. Yeah, most of you. I have to figure. So we'll forego the introductions, okay? Um, yeah, really glad to have you here. Really, really glad to have you here. We've tried to hit this thing from a lot of different angles, and the angle today is going to be a little bit of a biology lesson, as well as a toxicology lesson. So we've gone from geology to history to a miners panel to then agency involvement, all that sort of thing. So a little changing of the gears now, and we'll take a look at some of the biology of all this and how, uh, and how that works. So we're kind of getting down to the nitty gritty of, of really kind of why are we all here um, and, and start looking at some of those aspects. So yeah, glad to have you here. Uh, is Paul Lammers here by chance? Is Paul here? Okay, I then it's a little joke for Paul. Paul uh, gives the old uh, 10, 20, 30 rule about PowerPoint presentations, 10 ideas, 20 slides max, 30 minutes max, and Paul immediately said he was going to violate all three of those things last week. So I'm going to violate the first two in only 20 minutes. So fasten your seat belts. We're going to move, okay? Uh, we also have with us uh, Deb McKean from, uh, from uh, EPA Denver. She's a toxicologist, and we'll be glad to have her along, and I want to give her max time. So without further ado, today you're going to get an anatomy lesson. I do teach that at the high school. So you're going to get an anatomy lesson, and hopefully that will give you enough background about the anatomy of the respiratory tract so that as we start to talk about things like toxicology and, and then um, all the issues here, the card clinic folks will be here next week to talk about about the treatment of things and, and really talk about, about you know, why is this a problem? Why does the human system have a problem with this, with this particle? So we want you to have some, some background to understand the respiratory tract. For a lot of us, uh, our you know, high school biology class was a long, long time ago. So this will give you that, that good background. So I want to do that today. Um, important science principles then. Two basic principles you want to get started off with here. Principle number one, that is cellular respiration. We all need energy. But you've got to burn energy, much like you take a block of wood and put it in the stove and you've got to have oxygen to make that wood burn, we have to have oxygen to make sugars burn in our cells. So at the cellular level, we are taking in sugars that of course come from our digestive tract, and then we're going to take in oxygen to help us oxidize or burn up those sugars. And what that does for us is it releases energy. So we start with this material here, this is a formula for glucose, simple sugar, and then we have oxygen that we breathe in. When we break the bonds that hold the sugars together, that releases energy. And this is the energy that's available to power all of our cells in our bodies. We release carbon dioxide as a waste product. Of course, we exhale that. And we also get rid of a little bit of water, that most of which is uh, still reusable. Uh, to be a warm-blooded creature like we are requires a whole bunch of energy. If we take a 100-pound mammal and compare that to a 100-pound, say, reptile, so take a 100-pound dog and a 100-pound alligator, the alligator can survive on 10% of the amount of energy that the dog can. So the cost of staying warm and being at a constant temperature is huge. And so if we're going to burn up that much energy, that means we have to take in a whole bunch of oxygen to enable that to happen. So oxygen intake is critical. So the other sec the second principle that's important here is diffusion. And diffusion is that idea that molecules move from where there are lots of them under high concentration to where there are lesser of them under low concentration. And what they do then is they will continue to move into cells. So let us, let's think real simply here. Let's think about a bacterium that's, that, that's just out on its, on its own in the open. It's taking in oxygen through its cell membrane and uses that to break down sugars to power its cell activities. As long as that cell is alive and keeps using oxygen, the oxygen concentration in that bacteria will always be less than it is in the environment around it. Therefore, oxygen moves from the outside, high concentration, to the inside, low concentration. At the same time, that bacterium is using up the, the, uh, the sugars and, and the oxygen. It's creating carbon dioxide waste. So carbon dioxide waste builds up in the cell and as long as CO2 is, is more concentrated in the cell than it is in the environment, it moves out. So you have this gas exchange thing happening. Oxygen always coming in, carbon dioxide always leaving. Okay? That's in a single cell creature. Now in us, that's going to be a bit more complicated. Pardon me. I'm going to, I guess I need to postpone. How about four hours? That ought to do it. 
I don't think that'll be uh, more than four hours. Um, so, um, what happens then is that this process works very quickly in liquids and gases. Uh, this is kind of the uh, you know the iced tea principle. You know, we're making sun tea. You take a tea bag and put it in a, in a jar of water, and you don't have to stir it up. You just let it sit in there as it warms up from the sun. Molecular motion causes the molecules of tea as they become liquefied to move from the bag into the water, and they distribute themselves evenly. So this is just kind of a natural process where things move like that from one place to another. Okay, works well in liquids. Works well in gases. I mean, if I opened up a, a container of of ammonia or something up here in the front of the room, eventually you'd all smell it. Even if we turned the fans off, it would work its way through the room because it distributes itself out. So molecules move from where there are lots of them to where there are fewer of them. That is just a normal process of nature. Simple for single cell creatures, they just exchange that from their surroundings. For you and I, it's way complicated. We have 20 trillion cells and oxygen can't be absorbed directly through our skin. So what you need then is you're going to need some kind of a delivery system. Okay. We need a delivery system to get oxygen out to every cell in the body. And that's, again, trillions and trillions of cells. And oxygen will only diffuse over a few cell layers of thickness. Therefore, we have to have this network of blood vessels that go out in and amongst all of our tissues to deliver oxygen to the cells. At the same time, it's going to pick up all of the carbon dioxide and haul it away. So this delivery system is absolutely critical. So you and I have this fancy four-chambered heart system with all the, this network of vessels that carry um, everything that we need to all parts of our body. Absolutely essential. Uh, so the missing link then so the, is, is really the lungs. So how do you get oxygen from the air around us into the blood? It can't, we can't just soak it up through our skin. Or it, we have to have a way to get it from the environment into the blood. And that interface then is a very thin interface. It has to be because diffusion can't happen very far. So that interface then is the lung. So the lung then is a tissue that has, or is, is an organ that has a tremendous amount of surface area in it. Okay, lots and lots of, of surface area. So um, what we do then, is, well, and here's, here's kind of the, the, the measurement here. If our lungs were like two great big balloons, we would have you know, a few square feet of surface area inside the lung. But the lung, as we'll see, is actually a, a whole series of tiny little, little balloons. And if you open each one of them out and spread them out, you'd have a surface area of roughly a tennis court. Okay? So the surface area of the lung is huge, but it's got to be if it's going to deliver all the oxygen uh, that we need. Okay? So thinness enables diffusion. So the lung itself has got to be a thin interface between the air and the blood, but then at the same time, uh, what that does, because it's so thin and it's so exposed, this is kind of our area of, of greatest vulnerability. Then. So this becomes the place where we get a lot of disease and have a lot of problems and get a lot of foreign materials in there that we end up with, with, with issues with. So we all know from our own experience, most of your illnesses in the course of your life will be respiratory. You get a few digestive things, but we all know the digestive tract is a horrible place. All kinds of acids and enzymes down there, and we've all thrown up. So, pardon me, I, I, I get into entertaining high school students. So, <laughs> we've all grown up, and so, uh, so what happens, you know, it, we all know what, how horrible that is down there. So even toxic materials and things like that sometimes have a difficult time really manifesting much of a problem in the, in the digestive tract, where the respiratory tract is, again, just super vulnerable, and we get, have lots of problems there. Oh, by the way, I, I did happen to throw up, just for those of you, you know, you've got to wing these pictures in there. Um, normal lung tissue. This is, of course, exterior lung here, looking at the outer surface. Uh, a cutaway view is a, a, a longitudinal section. And then, just to throw that up there, this is what a smoker's lung looks like. Uh, not so good. Okay? Very delicate tissues and certainly highly impacted by foreign materials that get into the system. Now, let's trace the path then of, uh, of air as it, as it moves into this system. So we, of course, uh, and don't worry about all these terms out here. Uh, don't panic. The, that will be on the test. So uh, we take air in then through the nasal passages. And the nasal passages aren't just two pipes, but rather you have folds in here. And these folds then secrete a little bit of mucus. Actually, in the first part of the nasal passage, we even have hairs that are there to trap larger particles of material that we might inhale. So the hairs kind of filter out some of the, the, the macro particles here. And then some of the other smaller particles that get past the hairs, they get stuck in this mucus here in these folds in the nasal passages. 
what happens then is that you know, our nose may drip a little bit, we can blow our nose, we've all been out on a dusty road, and at the end of the day, you know, you, you blow your nose once and all this back stuff comes out. Uh, that it just simply tells us that nasal passages have been doing their job. They've been trapping a lot of these particles. So we can blow our nose, some of it ends up kind of draining down the back of the throat here, and ultimately then we just swallow it. And then again, we're back to the stomach, which is a horrible place, and not really a problem down there. So the air comes in here, it is filtered, it is warmed, it is moistened in these folds. Now, the air then passes down like so, and of course, air can also come through the mouth here, um, as we can breathe through our mouth, like so, and it all kind of joins back here in this area, the pharynx, the throat area, but then the air has got to move from, uh, come, c kind of, there's, there's kind of a fork in the road here, this continues on, this is the esophagus, which is just smooth muscle that's going to lead food down to the digestive tract, of course, food's coming in here through the mouth like so, but the air's got to come down here and make a slight turn and come down here into the trachea, the windpipe. The windpipe is always open. It's surrounded by little rings of cartilage that hold it open. It kind of looks like a vacuum cleaner hose and keeps that open all the time. So the air then has got to make this little turn and come down here into the trachea. Now you have a bit of, of tissue right here called the epiglottis so that when we swallow, when food comes down here like so, we don't want food to come in here as well. So the epiglottis covers over and seals up then the windpipe. So as you're swallowing, then um, that, uh, that, that food passes right by the windpipe here and uh, down through the esophagus. So air comes down like so. Okay? Vocal cords, of course, are in here too. This would be our Adam's apple, the larynx right here. Vocal cords are stretched in here as well. Now, looking at the lungs in the front here. Pardon the goofy expression on this guy's face. But um, here we have the lungs, kind of frontal view. Okay? So the lungs are actually asymmetrical. On the right side, we actually have three lobes of the lung here. And then on the left side, we have two lobes of the lung. Okay, here's our trachea coming down here, bringing the air down like so. If we were to take this, a bit of this lung, this becomes important in some of our later discussions. If we took a little, a little section here of the lung, right at the edge of the lung where it meets up with the rib cage, and blew that up bigger, so we look at, at this view here. This is lung, okay, this is rib right here, and then intercostal muscles right here. Even bigger view like this, okay? So here we have the lung. Here we have intercostal muscle. This is a cross-section of a rib. And there's kind of an important space in here, and that's called the pleural cavity. This space between the lung and the actual wall here of, of the rib cage. So we call this the visceral pleura, the lining of the lung. And then the outer edge here, this is the parietal pleura, up against then the, uh, the rib cage itself. And you have this thin space between. And in that space between, you have a little bit of kind of sticky fluid in there. And what happens then is that during the, the breathing process, you know, it's just like if you took a, a drop of water and put it between two panes of glass. Um, it kind of makes those two panes of glass stick together. It's even hard to get them apart. Well, the same thing kind of happens here is this fluid between these two surfaces, um, the lungs aren't, they aren't glued out here. They're not really attached to the, to the rib cage. Again, all you hunters know that when you, when you clean out an animal in the upper uh, chest cavity here, the lungs are just kind of deflated and just kind of fall out. And once you break the, the, the trachea loose, everything just kind of comes out. You don't have to trim much in there at all. So they are connected here in this pleural space with this little bit of fluid. Now this is going to be a place that is going to become problematic with asbestos fibers because they tend to collect around here. And we get deposits of material then in this, in this pleura, in this pleural space or this pleural cavity. So lock that away here because you'll be talking about that here later on. Okay? So the breathing mechanism. When you breathe, what happens here then is the chest cavity itself, we have these intercostal muscles around the ribs, and when they contract, they expand the chest. So the chest gets larger as those muscles contract. At the same time, you have this diaphragm, this sheet of muscle down below here, and the diaphragm then is kind of arched like this when we're relaxed, and what happens then is that when it contracts, it, and it tightens up like this, it drops. So the intercostal muscles stretch the rib cage out and the diaphragm drops and so it makes the whole cavity of the chest larger. So with the cavity of the chest larger, more space, more volume in here, that means that the air molecules that are in there are now under less pressure. So you have this pressure drop in the chest cavity. Okay? Then, because the air pressure has dropped in the chest cavity, it's now less than the air around us so air moves from where there's more of it 
outside into where there's less of it in the chest cavity and the lungs then are, are inflated. Okay? Exact opposite thing of course happens when we then exhale. The intercostal muscles relax, the chest cavity gets smaller and then the diaphragm relaxes so it rises and that kind of squishes the air in there, puts it under more pressure and so now the pressure inside the chest is greater than it is outside so the air rushes out. And we do this about at rest about 12 to maybe 15 times a minute, something like that for your whole life. Of course, when you're exercising, you speed up that process and this happens even more regularly then. Okay? All right. Now, let's take a look at the lung internally. So here we have the trachea coming down like so. Again, the little rings of cartilage holding it open all the time. And then it branches here. These are the bronchi. When you get bronchitis, that's because these guys are infected, either bacterial or viral infection here. And they, what happens is this bronchus then branches, and it branches even smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until ultimately it ends in a little cluster called alveoli. And here, here you can see them a little bit larger. They look like kind of a little, uh, like a little batch of grapes, okay? And these are individual little tiny air sacs. Remember we said that the lungs aren't just two great big air sacs, but they're gazillions of little tiny air sacs. And so all of these then, um, branches of, of the bronchus here, the branching the bronchioles and ultimately terminal um, bronchioles and in little air sacs, little clusters of air sacs like this. If you were to take the, the lungs then, uh, and this was done with you know, a person who's, who has uh, obviously donated their body to science, um, what happens is you have the, uh, the trachea then, um, this, is, this is trachea here, they filled this with some material so that it, it, it makes it solid and then this is the, the uh, pulmonary artery that's leading out to the lungs here and they fill that with some latex-like material so, and then this stuff all kind of sets up and then they just dissolve all the tissue around it and so this is what the lungs really look like. Again, obviously not two big air sacs but you have this incredible network of both air pathways and then blood vessels in here. Okay, so that's really what the respiratory tract looks like. Okay, now, um, actually, are these pictures real visible? Should I shut the front lights off here? Are they okay? You sure? Okay. All right, then, um, okay, so if we were to look inside the respiratory tract and, and look inside, say, the bronchus or a bronchial, what you're going to find is it's not smooth. This isn't just clear pipe in there. What you've got here is you've got all this, the lining cells of the respiratory tract here have these little special hair-like structures, the extensions of the cells called cilia. And they're almost like little hair-like structures here, okay? Here you can see them very close up. So this is the surface of the lung here, or of, excuse me, of, of the bronchial here, and these are the individual cells. They're kind of tall and skinny. They're all stacked here like books on a shelf, okay? And then here are the little cilia out here. These are the little sweepers. Now, what happens is that if you, when you're breathing, just anything, I mean, breathing right now, you're taking in dust particles right now. And those dust particles, if they get past our nasal passages here and get down past the throat and into the trachea, they may stick into the mucus that lines the trachea. So all these tubes that, that lead out into the lungs also have mucus inside them that line them. And they have these little cilia that cover them. And so here is a great cross section. And here's just an ocean of all of these, these little cilia here, I'm looking at a top view. But now here you see a side view. Here are all the cilia. Okay? And then here's that mucus layer. So a little particle comes zooming down here and he gets kind of as far as he has energy for and he sticks down here in this mucus. And these cilia then are little sweepers and they're kind of moving, they're beating back and forth in this rhythmic-like fashion upwards. So they're sweeping then these little particles stuck in the mucus up from the depths of the lungs then or where they got stuck in here up through the system up toward the throat where they could be swallowed or coughed out or spit out or whatever, usually just swallowed as we're swallowing water or saliva or food or whatever we're swallowing, okay? But this is just a great picture that, that gives that sense of, it's kind of like, you know, the concept here is kind of like crowd surfing, you know? Uh, where, the, you know, you've got a whole bunch of people holding up, you know, bodies and they just hand the body over like so. Well, that's kind of what these cilia are doing here with these little dust particles. So these dust particles stick in the mucus, the cilia move them backwards then, and it takes a while, and this isn't a fast process, but it keeps sweeping them out until they get back into the throat, okay? So that's kind of the normal cleansing system for particulate matter that gets down into the system. For our system to try to get that stuff out. Bigger particles don't go as far. They get stuck in the nose, get stuck in the throat. Littler particles can go farther. Depends on the shape of the particle. That becomes important too. So, here we are in the alveoli. Check my time. Okay. 
Um, here we are in, in the alveoli here. We've got blood vessels that go around each of these little air sacs. Each little air sac has a whole network of these blood vessels around it. And that's where this magic gas exchange takes place. So you have oxygen that will leave the air sac here and enter into the blood. And you have carbon dioxide that's, that, that is also um, leaving the air sac at this point. So you have this gas exchange thing. So this represents a capillary here. You have this gas exchange thing going back and forth and back and forth. Um, again, this is an electron micrograph of that, and you see all the little, the little uh, um, air sacs here uh, in, in nice view. Here's the terminal bronchiole ending down there like so. This is a cutaway view here of a microscope slide where you slice lung tissue. This is a capillary right here. These are red blood cells. And so what you see is open space. This is just all open space in here, and that's what you want to see in lungs, with lots of open space. These are the alveoli. But then you also have some little cells here. These are white blood cells. And these are kind of cruising the area. If you get particles that get down past the bronchial tubes and into the air sacs, air sacs don't have cilia. So air sacs don't have sweepers. So you can't get this stuff out of the air sacs themselves. It's down there. But what we do have are these white blood cells. And they are amoeba-like cells. They can surround and engulf foreign particles and then haul them away in the circulatory system. Okay? Ultimately filtered out by the kidneys through the lymphatic system, you know, multiple ways we can kind of get rid of those. But that's the way you do it down there. So no cilia in here. Now, asbestos particles, particularly libyanthable, real long, thin particles. These guys are like little arrows, very aerodynamic. And so they can be breathed deep down into the lungs, where other particles are a little more prismatic, a little more square. They tend to tumble. They don't go as far. These particles are just like little arrows. And so they go much deeper into the lungs than other kinds of just typical dust particles do. And that, again, herein lies our problem. So here we have our macrophage. This, this kind of tells the whole story. This is a white blood cell right here trying to do his job. His job is to surround and engulf foreign particles that got past all the cilia and all that other, all that other you know, system of, of trying to filter this stuff out. And now he's trying to do his job. He's trying to get himself around this asbestos fiber. These are asbestos fibers here, OK? And bless his heart, you've got to give him an A for, for effort, but he can't get around it. He just can't get all the way around that kind of a long, thin particle like that. So really, this is where the system ultimately fails. So these particles then are in the lungs basically for life. We don't have a way to cleanse those things out of the lung. So here we have normal lungs, okay? Light, real light, lacy, open, lots of airspace around here. This is what it looks like in, with a person who has asbestosis. You get fibrosis of the lung. It causes scar tissue, protein buildup. It's called collagen, a special kind of protein. It's basically scar tissue. It just starts filling in the lung space. And we don't know exactly why the body does all of that, but it just starts filling in the space. And so this person can't take in near the amount of oxygen. Their space is being filled up with, with fibrous tissue. Some of these little particles here of asbestos will even be coated with iron. We don't know why the body does that, but it coats, this is an asbestos particle that's now been then just wrapped with iron. But you can see how full all of this is. And then here you have an odd, this is from an autopsy, where they take the lung out, and this is a you know, worker in a shipyard who was exposed to this stuff for 30 years, and there's no air space in there at all. This guy basically suffocated. So, um, exposure. So when you get exposed, um, the system, our delicate little system now is at risk. And, and, and what happens here? Well, you think about exposure at, a, at the mine site with people that work there for a period of time. It was kind of on a regular basis. Sometimes it's massive and it's all at once. Um, we, this is all too familiar to us uh, when the World Trade Centers come down. One of, those, um, one of those buildings we know, and maybe the other one, we're not sure, but one of them we know was coated with Libby Monocote. So when those buildings come down, you look at this plume of dust here, and this is everything. This is Libby Monaco. This is ground up everything. This is ground up concrete. This is ground up computer monitors. This is ground up light bulbs. This is ground up everything. And so imagine yourself. Imagine you're standing right about here when this cloud. I mean, the building collapses over here, but you're standing about right here. And you're just getting engulfed with this. This is massive exposure. And our respiratory system just can't deal with this. Absolutely can't deal with this. So. What happens now is you've got a group of people who are massively exposed. Mount Sinai School of Medicine is doing it. They've got 25,000 people in a study cohort of all these people who are massively exposed at 9-11 to try to keep track of these people to see who has problems and who doesn't. Interesting thing is that not everybody's going to have a problem. Some people's systems will deal with this. 
You know, 2000, or 200 AD, Galen notices that, wow, but remember, no cause is efficient without predisposition of the body itself. Otherwise, external causes which affect one would affect all. And that's our frustration here in the whole asbestos business. We have people that worked at the mine for 30 years and still are doing okay. We have people who are just minimally exposed and have already passed away. That's about your genetics. That's about your own immune system. That's about how your body operates. So how can EPA come up with a magic number and says we're all safe at this level? <laughs> Not possible. Not possible. So we have to do the best we can to try to you know, see what's best for the most people. Um, that's a hard thing to do. That's a really hard thing to do. So you imagine these people here. So this is what people look like who were in that cloud and the kind of exposure they got after those buildings came down. And you have to look at all those and say, wow, some of those people are going to die young. You know, it's going to be a big problem. Some of those people may need, may lead a, a normal life expectancy. It's really hard to tell. But boy, were they massively exposed in all of this. So, yeah, it's a problem. So, that's as fast as I can go. Okay, um, now, so that's it. You got Respiratory System 101, high speed. Uh, sorry, I talked so fast. You have questions at the end. I'll be here, okay? Next, we want to uh, introduce then our, our speaker. Um, and we are grateful to have her here, as we have a number of other people who travel a great distance to come share with us. This is Dr. Deb McKean, and let me read a little uh, note about her. Um, she's a senior toxicologist and human health risk assessor. She received her master's degree in toxicology from the University of Arizona and her PhD in pathology from the University of Cincinnati Medical School. In addition to her experience in emergency response and remediation activities, she has been involved in the development of risk assessment guidance and health-based exposure criteria for industrial chemicals, as well as chemical and biological warfare agents. Dr. McKean was a member of EPA's Office of Emergency Management and Division Director in the National Homeland Security Research Center before joining EPA's Region 8 uh, Denver office, where she works on the Libby investigation. And we are grateful to have you here. Thanks a million. This is, I'll just click, click not click, okay. not click, get you forward, and if you want to point me, you point. Okay, great, thanks. All right. All right. Okay, can you hear me okay? Um, just thanks very much uh, for asking me to, to come here today. I've uh, visited Libby a number of times since I came to uh, EPA's Denver office, and really, I really look forward to coming here. I really like my visits here. And, uh, and I happen to like what I do very much, so I really enjoy the opportunity to tell people uh, what I do for a living. Um, just like Jean, I'm going to be covering a great deal of material, so um, hopefully I won't go too fast, but feel free to interrupt me with questions, and I'll be happy to stay after the presentation uh, as long as I can. Uh, we've got another presentation at 7, so, um, but I'll be happy to answer uh, any of your questions that I can. As many of you know, EPA will be conducting uh, a cumulative human health risk assessment for asbestos exposures at the Libby Superfund site. A vital part of that risk assessment involves the understanding of the magnitude of the toxicity associated with Libby amphibole asbestos. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what toxicology is, some of the specifics of asbestos toxicity, and then how that information is used in the human health risk assessment in making decisions at the Libby site. Uh, I, like I said, I've been here a few times before uh, to give talks on, on risk assessment. And so some of you may have been at those talks, but for those of you who haven't, before I get into the toxicology part, let me just give you an overview of risk assessment so you know where that toxicology information fits in. Um, we, are collecting environmental data, as many of you know. You see folks in white moon suits around here. And that uh, environmental data helps us develop an exposure assessment. The work we're doing in trying to understand Libby Amphibole contributes to the toxicity assessment. And we put together both the toxicity data and the exposure data to come up with an assessment of risk. So let's now spend more time talking about the toxicology itself. And so I'll start a little bit with a, a little bit of history. Um, many toxicologists uh, consider that fellow there, uh, Paracelsus, who lived back in the 1500s to be essentially the father of toxicology. 
Uh, he was actually an alchemist, so during that time, you know, they were trying to turn lead into gold and make concoctions that, you know, they thought would give him mortality. But other than that, he, uh, he uh, understood, frankly, the most basic present premise of toxicology, which was that all things are poisonous, and it's solely the dose that determines that a thing is not a poison. So what Paracelsus understood is something that we call the dose-response relationship. This graph represents what we call the dose-response relationship. That vertical part of the graph there where it says percent response, the y-axis, is represents then the percent of a population that responds in some way. Now that response could be somebody getting sick, but in uh, drug manufacture it could also be a good thing. It could be the therapeutic or the good reaction to a drug like you know, pain relief from aspirin. And the horizontal uh, part of the graph, the x-axis, is then dose. So dose increases from the left to the right there. So um, let's see, I'll try to, where's the pointer? There it is. So way over here in the left, what we have is that we're starting to give some, some compounds, some material to, say, for instance, a, a group of rats. We have, let's say we have 100 rats. And we're dosing them with some material. And um, at some very low dose, we don't see any effect at all. We see absolutely no response. As you increase the dose and give more and more of the substance, pretty soon some of the rats start to respond. Some proportion of that population responds. Until as you, I keep losing that, as you increase the dose more and more, more and more rats respond until you get to a dose finally where 100% of the animals that you've dosed um, actually show a response. And I don't know of any substance for which that is not true, where you finally get to doses where you see responses until all the animals in that group respond. But don't forget what is also equally true is that one of the premises is, uh, of toxicology, as Peristalsa said, is that there are doses, no matter how small they need to get for any particular compound, for which um, there is no response. So I can take that same graph and, and put names to the different parts of the graph. Again, if you go all the way to the left here and you're increasing dose, you, you have a, a portion of the graph here where there is no observable adverse effect. The no observable adverse effect level, or the no AL. And that's this section of the graph. You keep increasing the dose until you finally get some animals that show some effect. So that is the lowest observable adverse effect level. As you increase the, and, and that this section here where you just start to see an effect, that appearance of the th effect is called the threshold. So the threshold dose is where you first start seeing the response or the effect that you're looking for. As you increase the dose, you get to a point where 50% of the animals or the population starts to have a response. And some of you may have heard of this term before, the LD50. If the response that you are measuring is death, that is then the lethal dose. The LD50 is the lethal dose to 50% of the population. And then as the dose increases and you have 100% responding, you have reached uh, what we refer to as the plateau. So how do we collect the data that we use to develop that dose-response relationship? We could wait till bad things happen. When people get sick from exposures to different substances, uh, as in accidental ingestions, those reports are noted by the medical community. We may also observe um, effects in, uh, due to occupational exposures. Sometimes the, sometimes the community as a whole may experience an unusual rate of disease, such as the unusually high rate of lung disease here at Libby, scientists can do what they call an epidemiological study to understand what, try to understand what may be causing that high disease incidence. And that's the kind of work being done here at the Carr Clinic. They've collected medical data on a number of people who live in Libby for a number of years and try to understand how asbestos causes disease. So it's work that the Carr Clinic is doing with uh, ATSDR. Or we can do laboratory investigations, typically with laboratory animals. Both of these approaches have pluses and minuses associated with them. The epidemiological study is done with people, 
So that then has a, we have an easier time uh, relating what's going on in the test population to the rest of the population. But in an epidemiological study, we don't have any control and we don't always know precisely what the dose is and what the timing of the dose is. So there is uncertainty there. When we have a laboratory investigation, even though we're working with a laboratory animal, which doesn't always relate very closely to human beings, the things that are good about that kind of study is that we are very sure of the exposure duration, the amount of time those animals are exposed. We know more about the absolute dose that they're getting and also the route by which they are exposed. In order to have some confidence that some effect that we're seeing is from a particular substance, we have to be able to show three things. We have to be able to show that there's a source of contamination, a particular pathway and route of exposure, and also receptors to actually become exposed. Just because a hazardous substance is present, it does not necessarily mean that will cause harm unless you can also show that an absolute exposure occurred and that the exposure is out of a magnitude that can actually cause harm. So in the case of living amphibole asbestos, our source is the vermiculite that was mined here. And I'm pretty sure all of you have you know, seen these materials, these pictures, kinds of pictures before. And the fibrous asbestos was found as an unwanted substance that happened to co-occur with the vermiculite. And the picture like Jean showed, I, there's a picture of asbestos here. And of course, the fiber of interest or the material of interest is indeed uh, those asbestos fibers. Now, the, the pathway of exposure that we're most interested in here in living is dust generation. <clears throat> Asbestos in and of itself doesn't typically have the potential to exert toxicity until it becomes airborne and available for inhalation. That doesn't mean that there are, though, not other potential pathways of exposure other than dust generation and inhalation here. Then there's also the exposure route, and the primary routes of exposure for most chemicals that we deal with in the environment are inhalation, ingestion, and dermal or skin contact. So the way that airborne asbestos gets into the lung is through inhalation. There, are also some, there is some evidence to show that asbestos has some potential to cause harm through the ingestion route also. Then there are the receptors. So in this case, we're, we're most interested in human receptors. And as Gene said too, they come in all different ages, they come in all different health statuses, genetic makeup. And many of these differences do impact how a substance reacts with the body and to what extent it reacts with the body. So the range in possible reactions to any material may add to the uncertainty in our assessment of risk. And I'll get back to that in just a little bit. So again, as you can see from these pictures, asbestos fibers come in a number of different lengths and thicknesses. They can be smaller than a human hair, as shown in that upper picture. And they can range in sizes similar to many bacteria, and that's what you see in this lower graph. And it's very difficult to see the numbers here, but they, where the asbestos fibers are in length is 0.1 to about 10 microns. And as you've already heard, depending on the shape and size, of the asbestos fibers, they may deposit in different parts of the lung. But to get to the far reaches of the lung, the alveoli, those little, very little air sacs that you've been told about, where gas exchange occurs, those fibers need to be less than about 10 microns in length to actually get to the respirable part of the lung. And here again is a similar picture to what you just saw. Here, what we've got here are two macrophages. You saw one macrophage in the earlier picture. <laughs> but we have two macrophages sticking on different ends of, of this asbestos fiber. The mechanism by which asbestos actually causes disease is at this time truly unknown. We don't know precisely how it causes disease. But there are theories about how asbestos fibers, like other foreign particles, do indeed cause disease in the human body. And one of the ways that particles cause um, diseases, particles like asbestos, is that they cause inflammation when they are inhaled and settle into the lungs. 
the cells of the immune system will respond to foreign particles and try to destroy them. In their attempt to attack the particles, the immune cells themselves may release chemicals that can also be damaging to the lung tissue. You know, these cells, the macrophages, do contain little packets within them that contain strong acids, different kinds of enzymes. And as you saw, as they try to engulf particles, whether it's a, you know, a dust particle from smoke or a bacteria, they try to cover them and then these little packets of chemicals are released upon that bacteria or, or a dust particle, trying to dissolve that particle so it, it gets dealt with and the, and the body can get rid of it. But those same chemicals, the acids and the enzymes, aren't just capable of dissolving a bacteria, they're also capable of, uh, of having a deleterious effect on lung tissue. So because these asbestos particles are so hard to get rid of, they're so persistent in the lung, the macrophages and the other cells of the immune system keep trying to attack it, keep releasing these acids and enzymes, and those, that perpetual release of those chemicals have the potential to cause harm in the lung itself. So as inflammation and damage to tissue around the asbestos fiber continues, the resulting scarring can extend from the small airways in the respiratory system all the way to the tiny air sacs, the alveoli. And, 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 um, and even in the, you, you saw in the earlier pictures, the sac that surrounds the lung, they can all also attack that. And I'll show you some examples of that in just a bit. So once inhaled, the asbestos fibers remain in the lung for a long time because they're very hard to get rid of. It may take diseases a number of years to develop. And then the number of years, and in the, in the case of the respiratory disease we see with asbestos, it can take between 10, 40, or 50 years in some individuals for that disease to develop. That amount of time from the initial exposure to the development of disease when it's, when it's protracted like that is called the latency period. So let's uh, talk about some of the diseases. Again, we have a picture here of healthy lung and a not so healthy lung. And as you already saw, there is, let me find that. Okay, we have the lung tissue here, and this is a cutaway. But the lung has a sac that surrounds it called the pleura. The lung itself, as you've seen, is like an elastic sponge. All of those little cells and that very, very thin um, cellular layer that, that the alveoli are made of are really very stringy. As you saw in the pictures, as the lung expands, that entire lung stretches and opens up, causing that negative pressure for air to get into your lungs. And then those muscles contract the lung so that you exhale, and then that sponge gets pushed, um, pushed into a smaller size. That pleural sac that surrounds the lung, as you saw, there's a, there's a, a lining on the lung, and then there's the lining that, that is in the thoracic cavity. And you saw that there is just a, a small opening between it that is indeed um, it contains that slippery fluid that, that you were just told about. So that, that slippery fluid doesn't just hold those two pleural sacs together so that the lung expands and contracts. It also is a lubricant. So as the lungs expand and contract, that lung tissue moves very, very smoothly across the surface of the chest cavity. And there's very little friction while the, while the lungs are moving. When fibrosis develops, uh, no, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so keep that in mind. The lung is normal, it has that pleural sac on it. There's that fluid and everything's moving really smoothly and really easily and you, you feel no resistance as you, as you breathe and as you exhale. So asbestos fibers that find their way into the lung can get lodged in those alveoli and start to cause an inflammatory response. Some of the fibers can work their way to the outer reaches of the lungs where that pleural sac is and cause fibrosis to occur. This can, fibrosis can be in the shape of just little spots, little small areas on the, on the surface of the pleura, and that's called localized pleural thickening. 
The fibrosis can also encompass a, a larger area and be called a diffuse pleural thickening. But the fibrosis, as it develops on the surface of that sac that is closest to the lung, it will inhibit then the ability of that lung to slowly move across the surface of the pleural cavity. So it will catch up and that movement won't be as, as easy as it would be if those pleural plaques were not there. So the person that has pleural plaques may suffer from restrictions in breathing. It may not be so easy for them to breathe and they also may experience some amount of pain. With asbestosis, it is also, it can also be the result of an inflammatory response, but that formation of fibrosis, instead of being on the surface of the lung as it is with pleural plaques, it is within the lung tissue itself. Again, that fibrosis causes scarring. The lung tissue in the alveoli, as you've seen, is usually very, very thin. The alveoli themselves are typically one cell layer thick, and the capillaries on the other side are yet again only one cell layer thick. So the, the space between the inside of the alveoli, the, the breathing space, and the inside of the capillary are only separated by two very, very flat cells. So as you saw again in those histological slides that Gene showed, is that as that fibrosis gets worse and worse, and those two cell walls get thicker and thicker and more fibrosis occurs, there is no way that oxygen can then pass across that cellular layer. The fibrosis doesn't just inhibit the ability of oxygen and carbon dioxide to move back and forth. It also makes the lung less elastic. Instead of opening and closing like that elastic sponge that I talked to you about, each cell wall is so much thicker, it just doesn't move as well. So not only can the lung not fill with, with as much air, it can't contract as well. So not only do you have less oxygen transport, you have less oxygen in your lungs to be transportable. So as, asbestosis, like pleural thickening, takes many years to develop. And in the case of asbestosis, the latency period can be you know, as, as much as 20 years or more. Mesothelioma is also a condition of that pleural slack. And instead of fibrotic development and merely causing restrictions in breathing, this is then a, a cancer is usually an abnormally high rate of cellular growth. And so you get uh, rampant cell growth in that pleural sac and, um, and cancer uh, develops again, causing restrictions of breathing, again, having um, a latency period of of approximately 20 or, or long, 20 years or longer. So to summarize where we've gotten so far, the dose makes the poison. It's the dose response relationship that shows the amount of material that, can, that is needed to cause some amount of toxicity. For toxicity to occur, especially in the case of asbestos, you need not only the generation of dust and the dust is containing asbestos to get that dust in the breathing space. But then that dust, you must also then be in that environment and be in a situation where you can inhale that dust. So there has to be a source, there has to be a mechanism to get that asbestos into the air, and it has to get to a receptor in order to cause exposure. For particles to get into the breathing space, they have to be less than about 10 microns in, in size to actually get into the alveolar spaces and the small fibers of Libby amphibole asbestos can enter the lung and cause diseases such as asbestosis and lung cancer. So let's now look at how the toxicity information is used. Well, now we're going to use that toxicity information that we've gathered to develop what we call the toxicity assessment that can then be used in the risk assessment. In Superfund risk assessments, the toxicity assessment is a process that evaluates the dose-response relationship, and attempts to derive that number, that number that we can then use in the risk assessment to help us make decisions about the site. We, in EPA uh, risk assessments, typically segregate compounds into whether they're carcinogens or non-carcinogens, and some, like asbestos, 
show both kinds of effects. They show both non-cancer effects and cancer effects. For the non-cancer study that we use to derive the non-cancer toxicity value, EPA used some epidemiological data from a plant in Marysville, Ohio. This plant was owned by the Scott Company, who makes pesticides. And what they were using the, the Libby vermiculite for was merely as a carrier for the pesticides. Now, the good thing about the Scott plant is that they had a worker monitoring, health monitoring system going on for, for a number of years. So they took many, many air samples within the working space for the original purpose of actually evaluating the worker's exposure to the pesticides. Luckily for us, they also collected samples where we were able then to determine the amount of asbestos that they were exposed to coincidentally. And so this is actually an unusual study where we have really, really very, very good exposure data to actually correlate the health effects we see in the workers to the amount of asbestos they were exposed to. We were also able to have some confidence that their only exposure was at work because, again, this plant was so good in that they had the workers have special clothes on while they were at work. The workers showered before they left. The clothes were, were left at the factory. And, and then they came home. So they weren't carrying any of the fibers home to continue their exposures or uh, have exposures uh, by their family. Again, they were under a medical monitoring program, and that medical monitoring program discovered that many of the workers suffered from pleural thickening or, or pleural plaque, as we call them. Uh, the University of Cincinnati uh, helped EPA evaluate these data, and those are the ones we're using for our toxicity <coughs> assessment. We're also doing a cancer toxicity assessment, and for that, we're using uh, the actual Libby Minor epidemiological data to evaluate cancer effects. And um, those, that toxicity uh, value is based on both the incidence of mesothelioma and lung cancer. Even with the best toxicity data, there is still some uncertainty. As I said earlier, when we were talking about the different kinds of receptors, each population may have members that have different ages, different genders, different health status, and these differences can impact how the toxicity is expressed. But in Superfund and in EPA risk assessments, toxicity assessments I should say, we have a mechanism to deal <coughs> with uncertainty. It's not perfect, but it is a mechanism to deal with uncertainty. We begin with the dose-response relationship that we talked about earlier. So we have um, this uh, dose is based on air concentration of fibers per cc. And the, what the Marysville data showed us, we were able to then model the um, incidence of pleural plaques in the population at, at um, the Marysville clinic, Marysville, um, not the clinic, but the Marysville plant. And determine then that threshold area of the dose-response relationship. You know, I call that either a, a no adverse effect level or a low adverse effect level. When we get to this um, point of actually modeling the toxicity, it's called the point of departure. So where you depart from no effect to an effect level is called the point of departure. But we don't just stop there. We're going to step back from that dose because of our our perception of the uncertainty of our assessment. And we're actually going to drop back two times. So you notice that there are two little blips here. This is uncertainty factor one and uncertainty factor two. We're going to drop back one uncertainty factor of 10 to account to the, uh, for the possible differences in the human population. The people that worked in Marysville were um, for the most part male, there were some uh, women in the population, but for the most part they were male. And for the most part during their working lifetime, they were reasonably healthy. So that there are notable differences that one might see between the working population at the Marysville uh, plant and the general population. So we're gonna divide that point of departure by a factor of 10. Then we're gonna take another uncertainty factor and we're gonna call that just our uncertainty in the study. 
As I said, they took air measurements, but we can't know for sure precisely what dose was received by every single worker. They may have had a cold during some times and they weren't breathing as deeply. They may have had um, you know, medical concerns that were, were uncertain. They didn't have personal air monitors on each one of them for the entire time they worked. So since we feel there is still some uncertainty in our exposure estimate, we're even going to back down this estimate another factor of 10. So in order to calculate this reference concentration, the RFC that we're going to use in the risk assessment, it's going to be divided by two orders of magnitude or a factor of 100 lower than the original effect level that we found. Where is mine? Okay. Than the original um, number that we found to be the no effect level in the actual epidemiological study. So we're going to go back down a full 100 fold and derive a reference concentration that we believe represents. An, a, an exposure level of no adverse effects. So the RFC is a protective value representing protection, we believe protection from adverse effects, not a predictive level of where we expect effects to occur. Now that we have the toxicity data, we're also going to need some site-specific exposure data. So the exposure assessment will estimate the amount, the magnitude, the frequency, the duration, and the roots of exposure in Libby, Montana. Those of you from Libby and Troy are familiar with EPA's efforts in deriving what we call activity-based sampling data. For exposure, for asbestos exposure estimates, we conduct different activities such as mowing the lawn or playing in a playground, and we collect air samples to determine the concentration of asbestos fibers that may have been released from those activities into the breathing space. And we conduct those activities in different locations throughout Libby, in different yards, in different schoolyards, and in different buildings. In order for the exposure pathway to be considered to com complete and to be included in the risk assessments, four elements are required. Again, we have to have a known source and mechanism of chemical, or in this case, a particulate release. And that's typically the soil, or the dust in a room, or vermiculite, um, native vermiculite. We have to have a transport medium. In this case, it's air. We have to have a point of contact with the human, and that would be the contact with the lungs, and an exposure uh, route to get to that contact point, so inhalation. We then take that air concentration, that environmental concentration that we collected from the activity-based sampling, and multiply that by estimates used to describe how the population of folks in town may be exposed, such as how many breaths you take in an hour. It's not the same for every, you know, every person in this town. How long it takes to mow a yard. How many times you mow a yard. How long you live in Libby. Each of those factors, we come up with an estimate for you know, the average number of times people mow yards in Libby, or the average number of time that it takes to mow a yard. But those estimates are not the same for everyone, as I said. So although we tend to then slightly overestimate the exposure parameters, we do that to be sure that we've included all the possibilities without being crazy about it. You know, we're not going to say that you're going to mow the lawn, you know, 10 times a week for 52 weeks in the year. We recognize that in a place like Libby, you know, we get to the time of the year where it's either snow covered or very wet, and you're not going to mow the lawn. So we're saying that, okay, for about, you know, six to nine months a year, people are going to mow their lawn. We're going to say that they probably mow their lawn once a week. And that still may be an overestimation, but EPA actually has <laughs> this guideline book and it's about four inches thick and it provides us with a great deal of statistical information that's been collected from all across the United States and frankly all across the world about different behavior patterns of people and how much water they drink, how much, you know, Pepsi they might drink, how often they mow the lawn, how, how many times they, you know, practice jujitsu, you know, in their backyard. All kinds of exposure parameters that have been statistically analyzed 
And we don't take the average of that, we take what's called the 95th percentile, the upper bound of all that data that we take, and those are the values that we use to try to estimate exposure. Yet we still recognize that there still is uncertainty in that assessment. <coughs> so then we're going to take those data and we're going to do the actual risk assessment. We're going to come up with a risk characterization. So we have to use both the toxicity and the exposure estimates, and they're going to be combined for an expression of cancer risk and non-cancer hazard. So what we do with all that information, in the case of cancer risk, we take the inhalation unit risk value. I haven't talked about that. I've talked more about non-cancer hazard, but that would be yet another lecture. So we take the inhalation unit risk value and we multiply it by that uh, estimate of exposure for any kind of activity. And in the case of non-cancer hazard, just because of the way the units work out, we actually do a division. And again, we take that RFC that I told you how we calculate that, and that's um, we take the, um, the exposure estimate and we divide that by the reference concentration. So after we've added together the cumulative exposures for the populations in Libby and Troy, we then compare the cancer risk and the non-cancer hazard to acceptable targets. In the case of cancer risk, our target is a range. It's a range of 10 to the minus 6 risk or, or one additional cancer in a million people to a 10 to the minus 4 risk, which represents one additional cancer risk in 10,000 people. That's, that's our target risk. And risk found to be above those levels implies that something should be done. It's not necessarily more cleanup. It's something should be warranted to try to reduce the level of exposure and risk to an acceptable level. Likewise, with the target hazard for non-carcinogens, we have a hazard index of one. It's that ratio, remember, between the exposure and the reference concentration. So if that ratio is above one, or I should say, the hazard index, just as a definition, is the level at which it is unlikely that even sensitive populations will experience adverse health effects such as local plural, uh, localized plural thickening. Remember, the, the toxicity value was a protective value. It was not predictive of toxicity, it was protective. Remember, I divided it by 100. So when you get that hazard index of one, we have taken into account, because of the way we've done our exposure estimates and the way we've calculated our toxicity value, we feel that it's pretty unlikely that even the sensitive members of the population will experience um, any harm. Now, because we put a buffer into all these equations, even if the hazard ex uh, index exceeds one, there is an increased potential for adverse health effects. However, it doesn't mean that absolutely, if the hazard index is above one, that adverse effects will absolutely occur. It again, it is, is it a target that says, we should think about this, we should probably do something, let's decide what we're going to do about it. So, we've conducted a, a risk assessment. We've used science and science policy to come up with these numbers that have a representation of the toxicity of the compound we're interested in, the amount of exposure, that people are experiencing this town, and we have a numerical estimate of what that risk and that hazard might be. It is a number bound, but it is a numerical estimate. But the risk assessment is not the end all be all. We're not done. Because the risk assessment is now a separate activity from what we call risk management. And it's the risk management that then uses the information from the risk assessment along with other data to then make site-specific decisions. In Superfund, risk managers use nine criteria to evaluate the different remedy options to determine which one of them, or which, which number of them, are effective, protective, long-lasting, and acceptable to the community, as well as local and state government representatives. So each possible remedy, after the risk assessment is done, we evaluate any number of possible remedies. We evaluate them 
based on these nine criteria to see which ones would help reduce whatever residual risk is at, and, and this is done at every site, not just in Libby, Montana. So to summarize what I've just said over the past few slides, the toxicity assessment tries to quantify how toxic a substance can be. The consideration of uncertainty will lower the estimate of toxicity to a more conservative value that is protective of adverse health effects and not predictive of the harm that might occur. Both toxicity and exposure data are necessary to estimate cancer risk and non-cancer hazard. And we use nine criteria to help manage risk and to make risk management decisions. So thanks very much. And if you have any questions, fire away. Yes, wait a minute. What's our risk management number, our risk number? Say that again, please. What's our number in living? I haven't completed that. We don't have a talk. That's what we're waiting for right now. We're the, where we are in the, in the process for the development of the toxicity value is that um, folks from the EPA have put together the data. Remember I talked about the Marysville data and the Libby Minor data, and we've developed both a, what we feel are, is an appropriate cancer toxicity value and a non-cancer toxicity value. Hold on a second. Not done. And that document that summarizes all that information has been reviewed internally by EPA and by other federal agencies in the federal government. It is now in the hands of a board of independent scientists called the Science Advisory Board. They have been reviewing this document and talking about it for about six months, as I recall. They're about ready. We have, we're hoping to get their final report around the beginning end of, end of November. They will have made any number of comments about this document. We've, we had a preview of their, of their comments because they've had, I think we've, we've uh, announced to the community, they've had any number of conference calls that anybody could have listened in on, and um, they've talked about their comments. So they're going to give us their final uh, comments in the report in a couple of weeks. Then we have to take all those comments, evaluate them, and then modify the document. And if some of their comments require us to do more modeling, to you know, slightly change the, the values themselves, that's what we're going to be doing. That's going to take yet another number of months. When we have a final toxicity value, I and the folks that work with me will be able to actually do the risk assessment for living in Montana. We're expecting to see that later in 2013. So all goes well. Yes. Uh, in that study at, at Marysville, mm -hmm. uh, was some of that, the uh, plural thickening, was any of that from pesticides or is it all from uh, amphibol? Could, from, could from you what define know, that? From, from what we know about the pesticides that were used, there's, there, the incidence of chloroplax is not associated with pesticide exposure. We have a good deal of confidence, and, and it seems that the Science Advisory Board, as much as I know, agrees with that. So the incidence of chloroplast is most likely due to asbestos. Yes. One other question. Uh, um, the cancers, the mesothelioma, yes. is it only caused from asbestos? Isn't there, uh, aren't there other things that could cause that? To my knowledge, mesothelioma is, is, is Almost all the incidences associated with asbestos exposure. I, I personally don't know of other compounds, uh, unless they're, you know, like I said, the um, what we believe to be the mechanism of action for asbestos is, you know, this little fiber getting into the lungs and causing an inflammatory response, and then a cascade of events occur. There may be other fibers that also cause those kinds of diseases. It isn't only living amphibol. Other asbestos exposures mm -hmm. also cause mesothelioma. Mm -hmm. So it's not just living amphibol, but other, other kinds of asbestos <coughs> cause mesothelioma also. Yes? Uh, the Scott's company, you said they, they were having their workers shower and change clothes. How long ago did they start doing that? Can you uh, that? Were they doing that while we were still not doing it? And yes. still, was the mine still, was our mine open and, and producing vermiculite? Your and mine, workers weren't mine doing that, and they the were. early 90s, right? They were doing this back in the 70s, and the, oh, wow. I think part of it was the 50s, yes. 
Oh, uh, yep. <laughs> but remember, remember, I don't believe that it, early on they were aware of asbestos being an issue. They were doing this to protect their workers from exposures to pesticides. But yet still, you know, I, I have, you know, often said I take my hat off to that company for being as protective as they were to their workers. And yet the workers did get exposure and some of them, you know, did get illnesses, but for what they knew at the time, they were, they were taking some, I thought, you know, pretty good measures to help protect their, their workers and the workers' families by making sure they weren't bringing that, those things home. Yes, sir. On, on some of the dose response assessments, I'm thinking more on the risk assessment. Is there any studies done on, on smokers, and smokers' lungs, um, you know, and the effect on it? Is it quicker, faster, or uh, more prevalent in those? Well, you know, as you know, um, smoking does indeed impact cancer incidence in lungs. And um, I believe, I, I wasn't as heavily involved in the cancer assessment as I was in the non-cancer part of it. But um, what they do is attempt to do an analysis to separate out any impacts from smoking from it, they try to you know essentially subtract anything like that out of the background. Within the, for the case of the development of pleural plaques, um, smoking does not appear from the statistical evaluation of data to have an impact one way or the other on the on the appearance of pleural plaques. So that that didn't appear to hasten it or you know have have an effect on the incidence and the rate of the incidence. Yes, sir. Um, the once the toxicity assessment numbers get finalized and you know you guys come come up with numbers that you're reason, reasonably sure about the exposure levels i'm trying to build upon what dr meeker talked about in the first lecture about uh libby amphibole you know he mentioned there is a, a naturally occurring amount both from the reedy creek site and maybe another site up pipe creek or something he mentioned right. what would happen or or could it happen that your number you come to, you come up with couldn't be met in this community? Is that a possibility? It is a possibility. What, what, what would happen? And, and I'll tell you right now that if you look purely at the ambient air data that we have now, now that you know, now that the processing plant is closed and the mining activity has stopped, your ambient air level is below this toxicity value. So ambient air is is below that level. So the kind of what you might don't quote me on this, but kind of a background level of, of, of ambient air exposure is indeed below the toxicity value. So yes, there is, there is natural occurring species not just in the soil here at Libby, but all across the United States. Well, I just concerned about Libby amphibole because the numbers will be particular to Libby amphibole, right? Yes, the, the our, our the EPA's intention is indeed that you know the document is called you know toxicity assessment for you know Libby amphibole asbestos. And um, my, I would like to believe that more studies will be done in the future with other types of asbestos to then be able to um, compare the estimate of toxicity of Libby amphibole to, to other types of asbestos. And, but we don't, unfortunately we don't have those data now to make that comparison. But um, remember what I said about the protectiveness, not the predictiveness of the number. The number doesn't represent, the re reference concentration does not represent truly a prediction of effects. It represents a protection from effects. So we're two orders of magnitude below those effects, effect levels in at least this work, this uh, mining population, uh, excuse me, the worker population in the Scott plant. But that evaluation of Engineering feasibility, acceptability to the population, all of that, that's that's gonna be a discussion that this community is going to have with the risk risk managers to see you now how far above, how far below that the risk assessment shows that the exposure is, even with some background level of asbestos in the in this uh, in the soil that's just native here to uh, to Libby. So that we'll be talking about that. Thank you. Yes, I think there was yes, ma'am. When did this study at Marysville begin? When did this? When no, did so they were collecting samples of the air in the Scott plant? Oh, that that began, you know, many well, let me see, you know, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, yeah. Okay. 
Well, one of the things that I've heard in our discussions of, of discerning fibers per cubic centimeter is are they genuinely asbestos fibers or are you using a method of measurement that can distinguish between dust or other fibers that are in? So when you're talking about marital samples, is there any guarantee that they're genuinely measuring asbestos? <coughs> I would never say that there's a guarantee. All right. Well, yes, I know. What, okay. what, what kind of uh, measurement of uh, microscopic? And um, I will also, and I'm sure you won't disagree, well, I hope you don't disagree with this, that our ability to measure asbestos is, of course, better today than it was. But we have a good deal of confidence that the fibers that were being measured at the time were indeed, you know, asbestos form fibers, and that um, the, the measurements were. That that's the, one of the reasons, you know, we have that you know tenfold uncertainty factor for the uncertainties of the of the study itself, where we're saying, you know, we know more than we did back then, and and so we're going to take our uncertainty associated with. The, the what we can do now that we couldn't do then, and we're going to divide that number to make it more conservative to take into account the potential that the the, the measurement of the air concentrations wasn't perfect. We didn't we didn't multiply it by ten. We divided it by ten. Yes, sir. Hey, Deb. Um, you were talking about your your dose. Uh, uh, percentage versus uh, uh, population versus dose. That's in a two-dimensional situation. What happens when you add time to that? Uh, you know, in, in the case of this, if you had cyanide gas, for instance, the, the time is a lot sooner, so your dose is quicker. And it, how does that affect by uh, a material that has a long latency period? And the, the graphs that I've shown are, are very, very simple representations of the dose response relationship. The actual models that are being used to do the toxicity assessment for the calculation of the RFC do take into account time. Yes? From the information that the EPA has gathered to this point with the history of time, what are they doing for prevention or will it be a historical evaluation based on as time goes and the <laughs> epidemic of cancer that we've been told of from the very beginning of the onsite of the understanding from other medical research based on what knowledge we have and how that would fluidly change as time progresses with <coughs> Well, all, all I can say on that is that I am um, I won't say equally, but I'm also interested to see what happens. Um, the number that we're trying to develop for use in this super fun investigation, we developed specifically for the evaluation of asbestos exposures at super fun sites associated with living in coal. I don't know what the rest of the government's going to do with that information. I mean, we have not only EPA, that also is a regulatory entity that, that regulates not just Superfund sites, but you know, there's an office of air, there's an office of water. And then there are other agencies, as you're aware of. There's OSHA that evaluates um, worker exposures. There's the Department of Commerce that, that helps to regulate products that you know, go back and forth across the country and are sold. I have no idea what this data is going to be used for in the future. I only know that our hope, once these data are finalized and we can use them here, we'll be able to um, come up with a final remedy for Libby and you can hopefully get your lives back and your town back and we won't be in your face anymore. Anything else? Okay, great. Thanks very much.